What's up guys, Sean here, and today I'm going to talk about some myths that a lot of us believe in our society that are promulgated with the use of bad statistics. Now first off, if you're watching this video, I just want to congratulate you because you have made it to the information age, an age where information is at your fingertips and anything, basically anything, can be looked up by just touching your smartphone. Now while there are a lot of benefits to having information at your fingertips, that doesn't mean that this easy access to information hasn't led to the perpetuation of many myths by misinterpreting that information. So the purpose of this video is for me to go over a number of myths that seem to be backed up by numbers and statistics that you're likely to believe and prove to you that they are just that, myths. Now chances are, if this isn't your first time watching a video put out by me or a content creator similar to me, then you're already familiar with a very prevalent myth that's based on faulty interpretation of statistics. And that myth is the wage gap. The idea that for every dollar a man makes, a woman makes 80 cents. You likely already know that that is just the average earnings of men and women compared to one another and not controlled for factors such as type of job, hours worked, experience, etc, etc. But while that one is pretty commonly known to be fraudulent, even though it is repeated time and time again by Democratic politicians, that's not the only statistical myth that is repeated over and over again throughout our society. And a perfect example of one of these myths that you are likely to believe is the idea that it costs more money to incarcerate somebody for a year than it does to educate that person. Now the reason this idea has spread so far throughout the United States of America is that it pushes forward a number of ideas that people generally tend to support. Number one, a lot of people advocate for more public education spending. So saying that we spend more money incarcerating somebody than we do spending on a public education in a year seems like it's wrong and we should spend more money on public education. Number two, it forwards the idea that the United States or the American people are cruel. And if we're spending more money putting people in prison, holding them captive, than we are educating the next generation, then that can help push home and sell that message. Now you're more likely to hear both of these arguments in tandem than you are individually when somebody is talking about the education spending to prison spending gap. But why do I consider this to be a deceptive statistic that forwards a myth? I mean, if you open up your computer and you look up average cost per inmate in the United States, you'll get a number of around $31,000 per year. And if you look up the same thing, except average per pupil spending for a single school year, you'll get a number around $12,000 per year. Obviously, $31,000 is a bigger number than $12,000. So why do I think that this is incredibly misleading? Well, one of the things that you notice when you're comparing these two numbers is that you're comparing a full 365 day calendar year to a school year when a school year is only 180 days. So it's half the time in terms of days that you would spend in a prison, you would spend in a school, in a school year. Now, even though a school year is actually less than half of a calendar year, for simplicity's purposes, we're going to make a school year exactly half a year and half the per year spending on an inmate, which will bring us to a number of 15,500, which is still greater than our 12,000 number. But then you have to ask yourself, how long is a school day? And a school day, typically in the United States of America, is only about six hours long. But when we hold somebody in prison, we're holding them in prison for 24 hours. 24 hours in a day divided by a six hour school day gets you four. And when we divide that four into our remaining 15,500, we get a number of around 38 to $3,900 for the average cost to incarcerate somebody in prison as compared more accurately to the average cost to have somebody in public school for a year. You see, when you control for all variables, the per hour cost of incarceration is actually four times lower than the per hour cost for public education. Now, this isn't the only myth surrounding education spending that's prevalent throughout our society. I'm sure a lot of you have heard some version of the United States spends 10 times the amount of money on the military than it does education, 
which only factors in federal education spending versus the military and not state and local education spending, which is the vast overwhelming majority of education spending throughout the country. Because when you factor that in, you will at least get about an even level of education spending to military spending, if not more spending on education than you would get on the military. Because states don't spend money on the military and education is typically the number one line item in any state legislature's budget. Now there's many other education ones, but I wanna move on to something else because this isn't an education video. And that thing I wanna move on to is tax cuts for the rich. Probably one of the most prevalent political myths that are supposedly backed up by statistics, when in reality, it's just propaganda. Now, every time there is a tax cut proposed by the state legislature or the federal government, you will find commentators all over the internet, usually from a progressive bent, talking about how the tax cut disproportionately favors the rich. They'll say things like 80% of this tax cut benefit will go to the rich or 90% or whatever number just to make you think that the tax cut was written specifically to aid the rich. When in reality, the reason that you hear those huge percentage of numbers going to the rich is basic math. Let's say you have two people. One of them pays $90 in taxes and the other one pays $10 in taxes. If you were to cut both of their taxes by 10%, then the person paying $90 would save $9 and the person paying $10 would only save $1. Now, a modern progressive commentator would look at this situation and say, that's not fair because 90% of that tax benefit went to the guy paying $90 in taxes and only 10% went to the guy paying 10. Yes, that's how math works. And if you don't think that this example is applicable to the United States of America, you're dead wrong. Because it turns out in the United States of America, the top 1%, the evilest of the evil, pay about 37% of all federal income taxes, compared to the bottom 90%, the vast majority of the country, who pay about 30% of those same taxes. Now, just based on the fact that the top 1% pays more in taxes than the bottom 90% of the country, you can understand, with the example given before, how any tax cut, even if it's trying to be weighted toward the middle class, if it still involves some percentage points being knocked off the top 1%, will disproportionately benefit the top 1% because they're the ones paying the taxes. In fact, the bottom 50% of this country pay about 3% of all federal income taxes, which means that at a certain point, whenever you're cutting taxes, they're not going to see any benefit because they're not paying anything into the system for there to be a tax cut for them. When you live in a country like the United States, which by the percentages has the most progressive income tax in the world, with the bottom 50% basically paying nothing, while the top 25% pays 86% of all the taxes, any tax cut is obviously going to have more impact on people actually paying taxes than it would people who don't pay anything in taxes. The brunt of the tax burden is disproportionately tilted, extremely disproportionately tilted, toward the rich. So obviously they're going to disproportionately get the benefits. All right, let's move on from taxes to healthcare. That's right, I'm going over the entire Bernie Sanders platform and debunking all of his myths. Now, there are way too many statistical myths in our national healthcare conversation for me to tackle in this video, but one of the quick ones that I wanna knock out is the idea that you can compare the United States life expectancy to the life expectancy of other Western countries and then draw from that the conclusion that the United States healthcare system is inferior. You see this happen all the time, except all these statistical analysis are just comparing life expectancy in the US to a life expectancy in those other countries. What they're not doing is controlling for car accidents, homicides, and suicides. And the reason they don't control for these three factors is A, because most likely they're lazy, and B, because controlling for those factors would actually put the United States at the absolute top of life expectancy because people in the United States drive way more than the people in Europe do. So obviously we're gonna have way more auto-related deaths than any European country. And if you don't control for that factor, you're going to skew the life expectancy number. The same is true for homicides. The United States of America has a higher homicide rate on average than other European countries do. So if you don't factor out homicides when you're talking about the impact of healthcare 
on life expectancy, you're not being honest. You also have to control for suicides, same exact explanation. Now while that myth or statistical failure is relatively common and relatively easy to refute, it's not the only myth that has become popular in the United States of America. Another statistical farce in healthcare I see a lot coming from Bernie Sanders, and that's this idea that 90 million Americans are either uninsured or underinsured. Now while this is repeated time and time again by Bernie Sanders, by Bernie Sanders surrogates, by Bernie Sanders supporters, I wonder if these people actually know what underinsured means, because 90 million people sounds like a dramatic bad number, and uninsured, we all know that's bad, and underinsured, not sure what that is, but I'm sure it's terrible. So obviously there's something terrible happening in our healthcare system for 90 million people, right? Now one of the things I found funny about looking into and trying to define what underinsured means is that there's not one definition for underinsured. There's three, and Bernie Sanders is combining all three of them to inflate the number of underinsured people. And at least two of these definitions, first of all, there's problems with using all three of these in the same rank as uninsured people, but two of these definitions are completely ridiculous. Now, definition one is the most legitimate definition for underinsured, and that's economic underinsured. Now, what this refers to is a person who has an insurance policy, however, if disaster strikes, the combination of copay and the cap of the insurance won't cover that disaster fully. And a good example of what is meant by economically underinsured is an example from this definition that I'm gonna use because it's pretty simple and straightforward and easy to understand, and it relates to homeowner's insurance. And essentially, this person has a $250,000 policy on their home. This policy covers damage to their home and all of their property. However, their home and the property in their home is valued at $350,000 and a $20,000 deductible. Now, according to the underinsured economically argument, this person is underinsured by $120,000 because if everything in their home gets destroyed, their losses will be $350,000 plus the deductible, which is $20,000, but they only have a quarter of a million dollars covered, thus leaving them with a bill for $120,000. Now, if you transfer this example over to the healthcare arena, generally, this is what people have in their mind when they think of somebody being economically underinsured. But again, this is only a problem if the damages, or in this case, medical bills, supersede the cap that your insurance has. If you have insurance that protects you from everything up to a quarter of a million dollars and your medical bills are $100,000, then while you're technically underinsured for an expense of $300,000, you're still perfectly fine as long as your conditions are manageable. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, yeah, Sean, obviously it's called underinsured, not uninsured, but that's my point. It's only underinsured if your medical bills supersede the amount that your insurance company is willing to pay out. This is something that somebody has to take into account when they're buying an insurance policy because a policy that only covers up to a certain amount is obviously going to cost significantly less than a policy that covers significantly more. This is a cost benefit analysis that people make when they're buying insurance. So again, the economically uninsured, while that is a problem if you make a bad calculation, or the only insurance available to you doesn't cover what you end up needing, it's not necessarily a problem. The next one is called attitudinal underinsurance, and this is when somebody thinks or feels, even if those thoughts or feelings are not correlated in any way with what they're actually paying, that their insurance should cover more than it actually does. Now, to give you an example of how ridiculous attitudinal underinsurance is, if somebody has to pay, let's say, $15 for a birth control prescription, but they feel like their birth control prescription should be completely covered by their insurance, even though it's only $15, and even though the person can easily afford that copay, that person would be considered underinsured under this standard of underinsured. Now, while the next category of the underinsured is not as stupid as the previous category, it's still pretty dumb, and that's structural underinsured. And the way this classification works is that if one insurance policy, when compared to another insurance policy at similar costs, 
is missing certain things that the other policy covered, that person is considered structurally underinsured. Now, the reason this is not a sensible way to measure if somebody is underinsured is because if you're comparing two very similar policies and one has stuff that you want more than the other one, you should just buy the other policy. You're not underinsured. You have the same level of insurance. It's just that certain benefits that are covered by one are not covered by another, just like certain benefits in your policy are likely not covered by their policy. And if you think I'm oversimplifying what this one category of underinsured means, I'm not. If you look at the definition, it can be based on as little as one benefit covered by one policy not being covered by another policy. So when you hear a politician like Bernie Sanders, or anyone for that matter, say something about the underinsured, just remember the word underinsured is a huge range, ranging from people who actually have a problem to a lot of people that are just complaining and don't really have an actual issue. And if I'm not being clear, the overwhelming majority of the underinsured are in the second category, not the first. So that's all I'm gonna talk about in terms of healthcare as of right now. I may cover a bunch of healthcare myths in its own contained video, but for now I wanna move on to minimum wage and specifically the idea that the average age of a minimum wage worker is around 34 or 35. This is not true. What people are using when they're quoting these statistics is the median age for minimum wage worker, which is around 34. However, that stat is skewed because while a large portion of the population working on minimum wage are under 25, there's also a bump in senior citizens. And because there's a large amount of senior citizens re-entering the workforce for extra cash, when you're averaging out the numbers, if you don't control for that bump, then you're going to skew the age somewhere near the middle when that is not representative of who's actually earning minimum wage. This number will also include people who don't work normally but might take a job part-time during the holidays to earn extra cash, as well as a number of things that skew the results. This is why the average age is just not reliable. But anyway, those are my thoughts on a few statistical myths that I see a lot throughout our society. Let me know some statistics that are throwing you off, maybe ones that you've debunked down in the comments below. If you like this video, then please show me by leaving a like. You can subscribe for more content, follow me on all my social medias. You can support me via one-time donations on Venmo or PayPal or monthly on Subscribestore or Patreon. This has been me talking about lies with statistics. Till next time.